respect management as a design for pursuing and achieving excellence in organizations. Uh, we will end with a, a, a brilliant example of it, uh, and there will be uh, some time to discuss uh, some Q&As, and then we will close uh, at the end of this hour uh, with uh, some minor recommendations, but not minor, major recommendations uh, in limited time. So first, uh, I think it's time to uh, introduce Peter Blokland. He is uh, founder of BIAS BV in, uh, in Belgium. He studied at the Royal Military Academy in Brussels and had a career in the Belgian Armed Forces and NATO as a fighter pilot on F-16s. And uh, he says that he, he wanted to become a Formula One pilot, but his parents didn't allow him. So he became something I would say even more riskier. Uh, a fighter pilot. He was an instructor uh, on uh, some jets, a commanding officer, staff officer, uh, where he was working in training, flight safety and nuclear operations, um, aviation accident investigator and prevention specialist. Uh, he wrote two books on total respect management and safety and performance. He completed a doctoral research at the Technical University of Delft. Um, entitled Towards Sustainable Safety and Performance in Organizations. So, hey, this is a familiar title. He is also an expert for uh, NBN. Uh, it's for the, the Dutch uh, energy grid for everything related to ISO 31000. Um, and he likes to state that these topics, they took him in. And you can call it his calling. Uh, so today he will be speaking about the question, what makes people, teams and organizations excellent? Um, um, so, uh, before I hand over, I will um, like you to uh, inform you that uh, we are also recording this uh, this session. Uh, so, if you uh, like to be very uh, uh, invisible, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, dim your camera or hide it. Um, and uh, if you stay in, you just provide consent that you will be recorded. Um, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to feel free to leave them in the chat and we will be happily discussing them uh, in the somewhat limited time afterwards. And if there are some burning questions that remain, uh, we of course will have plenty of time uh, afterwards, but that is not part of this webinar anymore. Um, Peter, um, it's time for you to uh, take over. Um, and uh, working Thank you. What Thank makes you very much. Yeah. Team Thank you. Very very much. Much. Excellent, there you go. Thank you very much, Dan, for this introduction. Um, if you unshare your, I can share mine uh, mm -hmm. presentation. So, yeah, uh, so as I said, uh, towards sustainable safety and performance in organization was the title of my uh, PhD thesis with the undertitle Total Respect Management as a Design for Pursuing and Achieving Excellence in Organizations. And th this was, the, of course, uh, uh, TU Delft, the library, nice picture, where it, uh, where this design, uh, let's say, has been uh, scientifically underpinned and uh, evaluated by uh, a group of professors. So why? Why do we need uh, something like total respect management? Why do we need to become excellent? I think I don't have to tell you that the world is facing a lot of problems today. And I think we, to, to have a systemic uh, view on that, it's good to have, uh, to zoom out and to zoom out where these problems in essence come from. And, uh, as such, I can tell you that uh, it took humanity a million years to reach a billion inhabitants, which means about seven persons per square kilometer on a land. And of course, if you see this, this there's no problem, but people uh, don't ask that much. But 123 years later, that was doubled. And this is my father, born 1929, and we celebrated his uh, 95th birthday uh, a, week, a few weeks ago. Um, 
1960, another billion added. And I was born in 1957. So at that time, a lot of things were happening, but no problems of climate change, no big waves of migration, uh, unless there is a, a huge famine or a problem in the world. Um, 1975, another billion. 1982, another billion. And my eldest daughter, born in 1987. Now, 1998, another billion. 2010, another billion. And my eldest grandson, born in 2012. Now we have 2022, another billion. And my youngest granddaughter, born in 2020. So instead of millions of million of years, uh, hundreds of years, tens of years, it now in, a, in, in just one generation, we are adding the billions of people. And at the same time, as you see, my father is still around, age of people almost doubled the expectancy. So this is a problem, but you know, the solution can never be, let's kill a few billion people. So today, uh, we are using resources in a way that is, is, is not, not efficient enough. So we need to become more efficient, but not only more efficient, also more excellent. We, we, we need to create more value because if you see population growth, uh, look at the figures here. And, and most of the, 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 the growth in Europe and in the United States and North America is more due to migration than uh, to, to birth. Um, why is this? Why in certain parts of the, the world you have huge uh, population growth? Okay, it's a little bit age, but also, you know, in developed countries, <clears throat> children are a cost. In less developed countries, children are an asset. So if we want this population grow to stop, we need to create more value and distribute that uh, value a little bit smarter. So it's total respect management is about value creation and value protection. And of course, I'm not the only one that sees this uh, solution uh, in the world. And that's why the United Nations have their uh, sustainability development goals. Because this is, I think, the only way forward and the only way out is to have no poverty and so on. You, you can read them all and uh, look them up. Uh, I think this is, uh, if we want to have a, a sustainable future for our children and grandchildren and those who come after us, I think it's uh, very important that we take these uh, goals uh, at heart. Now, what is total respect management? Uh, total respect management actually uh, resulted from uh, the basic idea from my work in, 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 in the military uh, and uh, my five years of accident investigation. Uh, in asking investigation, I learned that even a little, little, tiny mistake can lead to a huge accident. Or the other way around, if that little thing wouldn't have happened, there would have been no accident. So the thing we used in, uh, in, in accident investigation was the Swiss cheese model of Dr. James Reason and uh, I think known for many people that are in risk management and in safety management. And basically, what does that mean? You can see, look at the cheese as being created value. And the holes in the cheese as where that value creation failed. So you can see the cheese as objectives that have been achieved and the holes in the cheese as objectives that haven't been achieved. 
And the problem is that cheese is not a static one. You can take a picture at a certain moment. Then, of course, if you take a picture, then you have a... Um, oh, no, I'm go back. If you can stop this movement, then you have a picture of what was happening at the time of the accident. But these things change constantly. So the holes in the cheese are constantly moving in size and location. And that is what I would call, that's the effect of uncertainty. You never know which kind of cause-effect relationship will impact your objectives. And ISO defines risk as being the effect of uncertainty on objectives. Uh, this is a, a definition that is not always uh, supported by many, uh, but I think it's the most concise, yet the most comprehensive definition of risk you can ever find or can think of. Because risk is about not knowing what comes next not understanding what comes next. So, James Reason took a kind of picture of this situation, this effect of uncertainty, and he says, you know, we have active failures, but these active failures are not enough to create an accident. You need also unsafe preconditions. And only if you have these failed uh, objectives and they align, then you get an accident. That is his, uh, his theory. So this is a safety theory. So what does it have to do with uh, risk? Well, I think it, it is rather reactive. We used to investigate accidents and then you correct what was wrong in the past. Now, if we look at risk, safety, and performance, and you look at it from an objectives-based uh, view, you can see that risk is about objectives in the future. Uh, it, the, it's the effect of uncertainty on those objectives that makes risk. Now, if you look at safety, and one of the first thing I had to do in my PhD was to find what is the definition of safety, because Everything about safety is always uh, the explained from the opposite, eh? from unsafety. Uh, we're looking at the holes in the cheese. We are looking at accidents. We are looking at the things that go wrong. But that's not safety. That's unsafety. So if you turn it around, if unsafety is a failed objective, then safety is an achieved objective or an objective that is not failed yet. So safety are about objectives in the present. And now you, we all know about uh, management by objectives and things like that, and performance management and key performance indicators and all those things. So, but that's about objectives in the past. So if objectives weren't achieved, then it's a bad performance. If they were achieved, it's a good performance. So risk, safety, or, uh, or uh, ob performance is about objectives and how you manage them. So if you manage risks very well, in the same time you manage your safety and you manage your performance. So if you want to be proactive and you want to be uh, become uh, excellent, you have to manage your risks. So that is what uh, total respect management is about, is zooming out, looking at the big picture and see how things connect. Now, often the Swiss cheese model is, uh, in a traditional view, is used to build barriers around the holes. And of course, that is not, I think, the way it should. That's reactive. So there is a hole and we put a barrier around it. And of course, later on, uh, the hole will be fixed. But the purpose is that you make sure that there don't, you don't get holes in the, in, in, in the road. That you, get, that you know that you, uh, in due time, you change things so that you don't 
uh, reach the, let's say, safety levels that are unacceptable. So what is total respect management is you look at the big picture, let's say your your strategy, and you zoom in on that strategy and you see what are the the tactics, the, the, the processes that are involved. And then you can look further and you can see, okay, what are the tasks that are involved? What are the, 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 the elements that, that are involved in, in such process? And then you can look at the, 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 the little actions or the, the functioning of things. And finally, you will have to make sure that these little things, also the little things, have no holes in them. So that is total respect management, is looking at also at giving things the right attention because respect comes from the Latin world, respicere. And respicere is, means basically to look again at something, to, to look better. And uh, we uh, translate it as, as respect is giving something the right attention, the right amount of attention. And just think of it. When do you feel most respected is when you get the right attention. Not too much and not too little. So that is what you have to do with all the objectives in an organization. Give them the right attention. And that means also the, the objectives of stakeholders that are involved in your, your operations or in your organization. Now, how do you do that? How actually do you apply total respect management? Now, then you have to, to stake, take a step back. So total respect management is a systemic uh, way of approach of managing things. And uh, this is the systemic uh, iceberg uh, presentation. And, you know, things happen in the world and that we can call these are events. And if things repeat themselves, then you can talk there is a trend or a pattern. And behind trends and patterns, there are systems. And systems have structures. And these structures are the result of mental models and cultures. So if in China, for instance, uh, uh, decisions are taken a certain way, uh, things move in a, a certain direction, you can discover trends and patterns, and at the basis of that, there are mental models and cultures that provide for the, the, the growth of that system. Uh, certainly in uh, Putin's Russia, uh, you have different mental models, different uh, systems, different trends and patterns, different events. And so you have uh, this in every large organization in the world, which you have all competing cultures, so everything is happening. Uh, trends and patterns cross each other. Um, but this is the, the, the basic idea. So if you can intervene on the level of mental models, then uh, you know that you can create systems that will produce certain trends and patterns and events. Uh, so that's why there is a lot of, of going on in uh, social media trying to to get people in a certain thinking direction, but you can do the same in your organization. So how does it work? Uh, first, you need to be clear about what you're dealing with. What is the context? What is the larger context the, 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 and, and, and the inter external and internal? And systems thinking is a way on how to look at the context in a more comprehensive way, in not a polarized way but uh, to, to, to be able to look at something from different perspectives. So that is very important. So you can build a vision, a vision for the world, a vision for your organization, a vision for your team. And in that vision, you can see what actually is and what needs to be. And then you have a gap. And that gap is where you, you see your mission if you want to reach that ideal vision and so that's the start of a, a, a from systems thinking you go over to an ethical leadership process because we need to be ethical to 
create value not only for ourselves, but for the world. And then we come to another process, which is a leadership process and an alignment process, because uh, you have this individual that from your vision and your mission, you with your identity and your values and conviction, you have to develop some capacities and, and have certain uh, uh, way of behavior to create the context you want to see. And that's the same for your organization. And of course, identity, role identities, uh, you have to see it as your ambitions. So basically, this is a process. Your vision leads to your mission and your mission leads to your ambitions. And then you have to feed it, these ambitions with your values and beliefs. Your skills and abilities will then, what they need to be uh, developed. You have to have a certain attitude and behavior and to create the environment that you need. So then you have objectives, criteria, mental models that will start building your system. And you have this alignment model. Uh, I will not go into much detail there, but so leadership, ethical leadership is the next step. And then of course you have all these objectives at different levels, starting with your mission, but also every action. And that is where you have to manage the effect of uncertainty on those objectives. And for this, I think ISO 31000 is the real engine of achieving excellence because you have principles, which are a set of uh, mental models. And the most important one is the purpose of risk management is value creation and protection. And then you have a framework, a framework that is, okay, how are we going to organize this in our organization and then you have a process and this process is a very very uh, important one because it's how you can manage things every manager should be able to know this process because this is the process that not only helps you to manage the effect of uncertainty on your objective but it's also a very fancy improvement process and with this process, you will reach excellence in your organization. Now, what will you, we have also, what is excellence then? Because excellence. Now, excellence is that for any product, service, process, task, behavior, you can look at if it's, is this effective? Uh, can we repeat it enough so that it's, we are productive? Is it tough? Is it safe? Does it have the right qualities? Can we repeat the same over and over again? Then if it's, if it's efficient, so can we improve on the, the resources that are needed to get the same result? Uh, is it ergonomic? So is it ergonomic? Uh, so it means, is it easy? Is it easy? And then is it ecological? So is it acceptable? And if you connect those dots, then you have a surface that will indicate what your level of excellence is. Now, what happens if you focus on one thing? It is that probably you will pull away from others. Something that happened with Toyota when they were going too much into efficiency uh, some uh, decades ago. So the purpose is that you always move on all fronts. So this is what I would call uh, total respect management in a, in a nutshell. Um, but what can you achieve when you have managed all your objectives and risks well? Uh, then you can do amazing things. So that's shown in the, the next video. Um, let's see. So we will see uh, a person jumping out of a plane without a parachute and he is going to land on the ground safely. Jumpers are away, jumpers are They're away. off. Now he's practicing the flip. That's how he'll have to land. He'll have to land on his back.
At 18,000 feet, the oxygen mask will come off. That will be from his cousin, Andy Farrington, who will be closest to him. There goes the oxygen mask. Now at 12,000 feet, he'll hear a beep in his helmet. That will tell him he's halfway home. Momentarily, we'll see his jump team pull their chutes, and that means Luke is all alone for the rest of the way. At 6,000 feet, he'll get another beep in his helmet. There goes the chutes. Luke is on his own. And the crowd on the ground looking up, they have a visual on him right now. He's in! And he's kicking and moving. From here it looked perfect. You've just witnessed history being made. Absolutely amazing. Now we want to wait for our medical staff to check him out and give us the official okay. The trap is being lowered. This looks like a win all the way. of his team hits the floor. History made as he hugs his wife. Okay, so if you have questions, anyone, uh, can, can, you, can, can you manage the questions for me down? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we are. Uh, I think we we are maybe maybe too flabbergasted on that people do this, uh, but that's that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Now it it shows that uh, risk management is not necessarily about our abilities, but about understanding, knowing and understanding the conditions, and perfectly knowing what you want and knowing and understanding what is necessary to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Peter. It's yeah. Alistair. I'm also a resilient person. I, yeah. kind of, I just wanted to reframe what you've just said, because I've spent most of my career in aviation and working alongside the military. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think we've probably got lots of stories we could compare. Absolutely. And I think what you've just said and some of the other slides that you have really speak to me about safety is not about saying no. It's no. about saying yes, but have you? Because I, I always like to think one of my, my good friends, uh, another Peter, he uh, yeah. he would unplug from the tornado when he was uh, on the, the line mm -hmm. and say, now you be careful, sirs. You could have someone's eye out with that. Yeah, and yeah. it's that acceptance that, Everybody knows it's dangerous, but you're trained. And I think I was talking to another, another, in fact, a colleague of ours, Mark, and somebody else in the in the forces, and they talked about you were never trained to perform an action. That was the mission. You were trained to survive. And there's one of the slides you said before about the uncertainty of risk. Yep. is the forces training is about you've got kit on you that is about 24 hours 48 72 hours of survival 
and then the thing that you're doing the mission is overlaid on top and, I, and i'm trying to find a way of how do we morph that into talking about safety and i think what you've said today i need to watch the video again and see if i can reframe it but it really speaks to that element of risk management is about survival we all know these things are dangerous we need to be reactive to the holes as they appear yeah. so this has been quite informative for me yeah it, it, it actually i i had the, the pleasure to be introduced to operational risk management in the Southern California Safety Institute uh, 25 years ago uh, by a US Air Force Colonel uh, who was at that time also a safety manager for Boeing. And he explained it very well. And I think the mission is first, but you have to look at the mission the way, what is the best way to achieve your mission? And that, there it starts. And uh, People think of risk as something negative, but risk is neutral because what is negative for one is positive for another. And that becomes very clear if you're in a military setting. You know, uh, if you're in a dogfight, what is good for you is bad for the opponent and vice versa. So that's easy to understand for a military pilot. But for in, 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 in corporations, this seems to be more difficult to, to be understood. Uh, and they, so the risk uh, managers, they are there to, to cope with the negative things and the managers, they take the risk. And it's in our language, taking risk, running risk. And if you have a mission, you take risk. And taking risk is pursuing something that is valuable for you. Anyone that likes to drive a car, knows that going to corners at higher speeds is fun. So they take the risk of going to corners at a high speed because it's fun. It's value. It is of value for them. But the more risk you take, also the more risks you run. And these are always connected. And at a certain moment, you reach a, a threshold. And if you don't manage that well, you reach that threshold very fast and then you go into the bad things. And uh, people are more, let's say, in general, risk averse. So they have conflated the, the meaning of taking risk and running risks. And there are people that are, really understand it very well. And they talk about, we take the risk of opening this new office. Huh? Why do you do that? Of course, you want to earn more money. It's not to, to be bankrupt after a year or something like that. But that's the risk you run when things go wrong. So, and that is the, 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 the definition of risk. The way ISO puts is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, which can be good, which can be bad, which can be even both. Good and bad things happen together. Um, and it all depends on, on how you look at it uh, from a, an objective perspective. So that's that's my take on it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other any, any other questions? Yeah. Seeing this, it is I think a lot. Uh, it is of course a it's sort of a, an overview of uh, uh, what is all influencing is all. But are there are there on here? If there are any other questions, please uh, speak up. Maybe you have some questions down. Yeah, I have one in the meantime, of course. I, we were just talking about uh, taking risk, uh, running risk. Uh, but I think in, in um, our everyday language, we also talk about um, risks and we talk about opportunities i also think that the the standards say something and then yeah. uh, uh, but but in a lot of comp uh, or at least organizations that we see that it's risk management is mainly like preventing yeah. uh, preventing preventing yeah. harm from from risks yeah. and yeah. Uh, opportunity management so, so can you maybe elaborate a bit on, on what you see there oh absolutely and this is the, an absolutely very important uh, issue you touch because now we're talking about concepts and concepts are mental models and the current concepts that are in general in the world are not helping us 
and speaking in risk and opportunity is disconnecting risk from the positive and seeing opportunity as only something positive. And this is really, really uh, co uh, uh, not correct. Huh? Uh, you have risk and you have risk sources. And that's why I love ISO 31000 because, and I would say if you really want to understand that you have to go back to the 2009 version, uh, because it offers a, a number of definitions that are all neutral. And a risk source is something that can give rise to risk. And for me, an opportunity or is a risk source. And it becomes very clear because what is very well known in the business world is a SWOT. Strengths, yeah. weaknesses, opportunities and threats. So why don't we talk about threats and opportunities or strengths and weaknesses or vulnerabilities? Because these are risk sources and they don't mean anything as long as they are not tied to an objective. So many people talk about risk sources, but if you talk about risk and opportunity, then you're not talking about things on the same level. You're not talking about pears and apples, but you're talking about pears and apple juice. <laughs> and 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 that's that's a, something uh, that's another mission of mine to to get this out because these are are mental models that are blocking a, a, a perfect functioning of risk management in organization because the opportunities are pursued by the managers. And the risk is has, has to be managed by the risk managers who don't manage anything but just write reports. Mm -hmm. And that is the current practice uh, that because there is also another uh, misconception about the word risk management. And even uh, academics make that mistake. Uh, they see risk management as being uh, a synonym for risk assessment. So risk management in the end for them is coming up with a number of a risk. And that's of an individual risk, very specific. But risk is never uh, isolated. It's always, it's a whole network of little objectives that change in time and, uh, and location. So if you want to have this more comprehensive, more holistic view on risk, safety and performance, you need to get rid of words like risk and opportunities. I would say get rid of the word mitigating risk because then you're only looking at the negative. And these are very important aspects we need to change in the world today if we want to achieve that excellence that is needed to get a sustainable future for our uh, people that come after us. And, and and it's it's I think you, you touched a very 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 important uh, aspect of of managing risk in organization, because risks need to be managed by the managers, every manager at every level. They need to understand that it's a process, it's a management process. And, and why do I understand that? Because I recognize the the ISO thirty one thousand uh, process as the way how I managed things when I was uh, at uh, aviation safety, responsible for bird strike uh, prevention, uh, uh, preventive equipment, uh, uh, pilot gears and so, and things like that. And that was also a process of, of learning, uh, trying to understand things, getting the information, zooming out, get the big picture, then come up with some objectives, then see how, what is the best way towards that objective and what do we need to take into account to make it happen. And when I used that uh, process, then I knew I would get a result. And uh, many of those things are still, uh, yeah, in, in function today. Mm -hmm. Good, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That that, that is uh, yes. So, and I think it's also part of it is about language. Yeah? That they uh, they tend to say that uh, if a language dies out, also a culture dies out. So I think it is very related. Yeah. And this is a very good moment that someone is uh, ringing. Uh, but one question that I have 
is uh, what do you often see that the contributors are for not fully implementing ISO 31000? Oh, I, I think the first one is that it's it's in ISO 31000. It, it says risk management guidelines. And as I already pointed out how uh, big corporations see risk, then of course it were risk managers that uh, got to know ISO 31000 first. And then you have this uh, these principles, uh, general ideas, mental models. It's not something where they care much about. Uh, they care about uh, the numbers, the, the information, the tools. And so they, I think they dismiss that part. There's a whole vocabulary in ISO 31000, but they already had a vocabulary. They already had a set of mental models and that vocabulary didn't fit in those mental models. So that's 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 another thing. Uh, third, uh, well, you have the framework and the ISO 31000 framework starts with a strong leadership commitment. Now, risk managers, often uh, as a subset of the CFO. Yeah, where do you get the, the, the strong leadership commitment needs to come from a CEO? So you first have to convince the C CFO that he has to talk to the CEO and so too difficult. So no frameworks. So and then we come to the process. The process starts with communication and consultation. Yeah, why? Yeah, it's become to get a big picture. It's to get all the criteria right, to know what objectives are involved. They are not into that. So they know what, the, what, what they need to uh, investigate. They just look at risk registers and they build nice risk matrices and things like that. And then they write right ports. So that doesn't fit. And communication and consultation then becomes writing a report and handing and talking at a meeting to the boss about the risks. And so that, that process is never really uh, and has never really entered organizations in the right way. And what they recognize is, of course, the, the, the assessment part, identify risk, analyze risk, evaluate risk. Mm -hmm. And then in the, the second, in the first update, they added to the process reporting, which I think shouldn't be in there. Documentation is maybe something that should be in there. But reporting, if ISO 31000 is a, a, a standard that is uh, meant to serve everyone, even uh, little companies like you and me, uh, where would we send the report to? Where would I send it? I would only report to myself or maybe to my wife. So, so that is something that is 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 good for large companies, but not for uh, SMEs and things like that. Um, so I think that is the reason why ISO 31000 hasn't been understood and hasn't been implemented. Now I can tell you, I, I past six months, I have done uh, uh, a lot of interviews. Uh, that's how we met uh, also. Um, and I only encountered one organization that says, oh yes, ISO 31000, uh, yes, we use it. And that was a sustainability manager. So I knew they really used it because it was not a risk manager talking to me. And uh, I said, and does it work? Oh, yes, of course it does work. It, since we use this uh, ISO 31000, our performance is going up. And the performance of a sustainability manager was, of course, oil spills and things like that in the, in the organization. And they, each year they had less uh, problems and uh, less losses. So I know it works, mm -hmm. but people tend to judge ISO 31000 from how it is implemented in general. But, you know, uh, you have to compare ISO 31000 with a car. And if you only have a chassis and an engine and a steering wheel, you won't go far. You need every aspect of a car to be able to move it around. And that is the problem of ISO 31000. It's often lacking uh, 
a framework. It's often lacking the vocabulary, uh, which, which are the, the mental models that have to drive the system and have to make the system work the way it should work. Yeah, I think people that are attending or viewing this webinar might relate to some of these observations. Um, yeah. And if we turn it around, what would you say? What are what are like success factors? Or say, hey, but okay, we see that that ISO thirty one thousand is a is a gives us like a very good uh, framework or uh, an approach. Where where to to start? Um, what would be uh like like two main main elements that you can influence for uh, success which the the most important thing is leadership commitment because without the leadership commitment it's impossible to develop a framework and implement the process throughout the organization mm -hmm. uh, second i think it's the vocabulary and the principles because these are the mental models that will build the system on which your framework and your process will uh, uh, thrive, let's say. That these are, I think, two crucial things and two crucial things that are, I think, too often missing. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, But that is... you know, about mental models, uh, in my PhD, I came across uh, Donala Meadows uh, uh, leverage, uh, points of leverage. And uh, you, you, you can try to change people's behavior and things like that. But the, the most important leverage point is getting rid of old paradigms. You first need to let go of old mental models uh before you can adopt new ones and the second highest leverage point is mental models but if you come with new mental models and people can't uh, get away from old mental models let's say risk is mitigated we talk about risk and opportunities these are old mental models mm -hmm. if we can't get rid of that it's very difficult to see risk as the effect of uncertainty where this effect can be negative, positive, or both. Okay. So should you also, as a as a risk manager or a custodian of this this process, uh, really help the uh, the leadership to to start using this new vocabulary? I think that's that's the the, the biggest problem. I think. Uh, yes. Uh, I think this is easier when the risk manager, uh, the one who oversees uh, the risk fra risk uh, management framework and the process uh, implementation throughout the organization, if that person would be in a, a direct link with the chief executive officer. Yep. Uh, and uh, um, I know this is also the same for the, the same for safety managers or any quality managers. Uh, if you don't have direct access to the big boss, then it becomes very difficult because then other people have to translate your message to them. And that's always a, a, a weak point. Yeah. Then um, a final question that I have uh, yeah. about, uh, I think it relates to, to reporting or maybe see if there is another uh, important mm -hmm. question. Um, yeah, it is about detail. You said it is about uh, translating a strategy into tactics, into uh, yeah. like objectives, but but it it uh, they say the devil is in the detail. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sometimes yeah. you have to act on the detail. Um, yeah. Can you give one advice how to sort of handle uh, level of, of level of detail? Well, it all depends on your level of performance already. Huh? Uh, it, it, you have to. I think more important is you have to look at it as a continuous improvement process. Mm -hmm. And maybe at first you, you only have time, you only have resources to look at the big things. But it's a mindset. It's a mental model that needs to be implemented so that people all throughout the organizations 
we'll just have the the idea. Oh, here's a here's a cable that is running loose some, somewhere, or here is a, a you know it, it, this cable has some you know it's it's not fully isolated anymore. You have organizations where this picked up immediately. The cable is replaced, and no problem. Other organizations maybe look at it and say, yeah, okay, it has been there for so long time, so why bother? And the next day, the whole uh, office uh, burns down because there was a, a, a short circuit, you see? Yeah. So so that's an example of how even the stupid little things can uh, cause big accidents if the latent conditions are there. Yes, right. Um, well, I would say sufficient food for thought. Uh, thank you um, for this very uh, condensed uh, approach and uh, yeah. explaining on it. Um, um, I uh, I'm glad to announce and uh, let me share uh, share that uh, that you will also offer um, well a foundations course on how to do this. Uh, which I, we are happily promoting. It will mm -hmm. take place uh, in Brussels uh, at the end of this month. Yep. Uh, so if you, uh, I think this is a good opportunity for for people to attend uh, to uh, to really spend some time on uh, on these foundations and to go deeper into the questions that we have been discussing. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and I can tell that there are lots of courses of ISO thirty one thousand uh, in the world. But uh, most of them are given by risk managers that are not giving really the ISO 31000 as a whole, but are more talking about the tools that are in ISO 31010 because that's what they understand. But ISO 31000 is for managers, while ISO 31010 is for risk managers. That's maybe so. This is really an opportunity if you really want to. To, to get to know ISO 31000 the way it should be understood in organizations and how you can benefit from, really benefit from it, then uh, you're all invited. Great, yeah, and I, uh, it is, uh, it is, there is a good discount, so uh, I said everybody, Absolutely. Yeah. go for it. We have no, uh, uh, we have no other uh, benefits from it, but we uh, think just it's good to, to do this. Uh, and last but uh, but not least, uh, we also uh, have our own making risk manageable event in Manchester, um, uh, which takes place in November later this year. Um, we had uh, several of them. Uh, I think it is MRM four, but it might be. Uh, 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 I might have been discounting one or up. Uh, everybody, welcome. We will be uh, speaking on. Uh, the, the 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 theme is about visualizing knowledge. That's in the end what we uh, as Resilium really like to uh, work on and enable organizations to make the clear decisions around uh, around risk, so that in the end uh, the wisdom that you have in your organizations can be operationalized. Well, isn't and, that great? Uh, this is completely how risk management should be approached, uh, Dan. I I really love the title. Great, great, great. It's uh, so that's uh, compliments to the resilient team. Well done. Uh, here you can uh, find all the, the links. Uh, everybody, welcome. Uh, um, I hope you uh, enjoyed this webinar as much as I did. Uh, thanks all for uh, uh, attending, and uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all and speaking soon. Right on time. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.